share full screen. All right, you go down here, open up the chat window. Okay. So as I was just saying, what we're going to do today is that we're going to continue going on about uh, we're going to continue covering uh, regular expressions. I'm going to try to host the last quiz tonight um, on Monte Carlo approximations. I'll make it do probably very close to the end of the semester. Um, remember that, and if you've done well on all the quizzes so far, then uh, there's no need to take it. I've manually grade, I should have manually graded everything in quiz four, by the way. Um, but if you feel like that's not correct, let me know. I'll go through and do the same for quiz five as well. Okay, because some of the questions they had different interpretations as what they wanted to do. So, like with red and scarlet, that that one that question had multiple interpretations. So, Wait, what? for one of the quizzes, Which quiz? I think that was quiz four. Quiz five, the one that was just due. Okay. okay. Quiz, yes. Uh, Sorry? Yes, the final does have a Monte Carlo approximation. So the um, it will most likely be something like a game uh, and asking you to simulate it, uh, the outcome of it. Um, I will be going over the Next week, I'll go over um, some of the more uh, some of the one, some of the problems from a previous final exam, just so that you can see what's going to be there. Um, specifically, I'm going to go over the Monte Carlo there. So, all right. What we are going to do now, though, is I'm going to talk about regular expressions. Um, so we were talking about regular expressions, and first off, I forgot to mention. Uh, but I sent it out in an announcement, but you may not have seen it. Automate the boring stuff.com. So this is linked to on the syllabus. Okay. Oh, of course. Okay. It's, I only just started showing, uh, showing things that were interesting. So no worries. So this website, automate the boring stuff dot, uh, with Python. So on automate the boring uh, stuff.com. It's pretty awesome. Um, this is a, one of those, again, it's a free textbook for Python, uh, although it's not really, it's not really, you know, I don't think it's really like uh, necessarily uh, targeted towards a college, you know, college students or a college computer science class. Just as some, more sore, more towards the hey, you want to pick up some some Python and see if it can make your life easier by automating some boring parts of your office job, which is useful. Um, but it does have a chapter on regular expressions, which is really good, chapter seven. So that's why I bring it up. And again, it's a free textbook under the Creative Commons license. Um, like, and it goes through hey the kind of same things I was going through, how to find a phone number without regular expressions. And now how do you find a phone number using regular expressions? And talks about, now he uses match objects, which is like, I guess the way you're supposed to do it. But what you do is you compile an expression and then use that expression to, uh, that expression object and search for it. But it, it, it's, there, there are multiple ways to do regular expressions. Um, but the main thing to know is the syntax. Um, there, and, he's, and, and so it's a pretty thorough guide to using regular expressions. Um, also worthwhile to note is that he's got a list of other books that he's worked with, um, including Making Games with Python and Pygame. So if you're looking at doing something in Pygame, he's got some demo projects over there uh, to look at and get some inspiration from. Um, also, again, if you're still trying to think of something to do or you're not really, uh, if you don't really like the idea of what you're doing, again, I just want to recommend that if you like playing a video game, think about making a mod for the video game, right? That'd be very entertaining and pretty cool to see. So just keep that in mind. All right. So 
why do we care about regular expressions? Regular expressions, um, so regular expressions just don't really fit anywhere in, the, in a good place in a computer science curriculum because they, they're, they're distinct from anything else. And you can use them like a command line tool, but really like the best place, I mean, and like the place to really put them and the place I learned them was in computer automata, which is a, which is not even necessarily always offered. Automata, uh, which is automata theory, which is, involves state diagrams like these. Okay. And the idea here, automata theory is, is that you've got some kind of combinational logic, finite automata or finite state machine, basically uh, something like a turnstile is a finite state machine. Put in a coin, it's unlocked. You put in another coin, it stays unlocked. You push it and transitions to lock. If you push it while it's locked, it stays locked. Basically, it's, it's, they, there's a finite number of choices and a finite number of states. Um, so, but a lot of interesting things can be modeled using these finite state machines and they have mathematical models or rather mathematical and therefore linguistical uh, uh, models, a quintuple of sigma s, s naught, you know, it's just, so the entire thing here is that regular, is that what's interesting and we, what we learn is that regular language, what we call regular languages are, are basically uh, equivalent to, uh, to these finite state machines, um, right? So what is a regular language is a language that can be defined by a regular expression. And now you can see why, why basically like you kind of learn it if you decide to learn automata theory, because, um, and, and it turns, and it turn, and basically it has all these kind of mathematical properties, which are kind of weird. But the idea here is that you've got uh, different states of, uh, levels of languages you can kind of for that have different levels of power. What do I mean by that? There are some things that regular expressions are really strong, but there are things they cannot do. Uh, the idea with a regular, what a regular expression cannot do essentially is uh, counting a, or rather counting, keeping a memory of something complex when it's counting. So an example of that is parentheses matching. So basically making sure that there are enough open and closed parentheses in the proper order. Regular expressions can't do that. You can check if there's, if you see an open parentheses and there's a single closed parentheses, you can do that, but you can't do an art, you can't marry a regular expression that, that will, you know, remember how many parentheses, open parentheses it's seen and count and how many closed parentheses it's seen. For those, you need a bit more of a complex, Flex language for that, but that's actually. But so long as you're not trying to do anything like that, which you think, hey, maybe I need a program for that. Regular expressions are great. So there are a lot of different types of uh, regular expressions. Uh, there's a blacklist on Wikipedia that uses regular expressions to identify bad titles, um, and they and regular expressions therefore take a lot of linguistical stuff from this kind of math theory. So that's where you get weird, where you see some of the weird syntax from. But again, nobody really writes these from scratch unless they, they know some, they, they are really, you know, they really understand them and understand them really well. So let's review. Um, I can, so for instance, if I wanted to search for the word the, this regular expression, T-H-E, looks for a teach, T followed by an H, followed by an E, a lowercase T, followed by a lowercase H, followed by a lowercase E. Oh, I see a question in the chat. Yeah. And then if I do, but if I do this, 
these brackets indicate one of the following. Basically, either an uppercase or lowercase t followed by an h followed by an e. So this bracket is probably the most useful tool you'll have because if you forget all the shortcuts, you have this right here for you to use, right? Which is any one of which, and the brackets mean any one of these selection things. So any either a t uppercase t or a lowercase t followed by an h followed by an e. It's pretty cool. It's useful. Um, so this this can be so brackets are also useful for basically saying hey. Can I find something that doesn't match? So, uh, for instance, let's see. Expression. So, let's see with A E I O U. So, right now, this is basically anything that has a vowel. And this is anything that has two vowels in a row, right? So any one of AEIOU followed by any one of AEIOU. And we learned last time that we can shorten that using what's called a quantifier. Saying two of the preceding. I was mentioning about, about finding a good for finding stuff you don't want. So we can reverse this by using a caret at the beginning. And notice what happened there. So alt vowels, anything that's not a vowel, well, technically anything that's not an uppercase vowel, sorry, lowercase vowel, but as you can see, uppercase vowels highlighted because it's case sensitive. So if I wanted to go with anything that's not a vowel, A-E-I-O-U or A-E-I-O-U. So anything that's not that, not a vowel. Make sense so far? So these are pretty good. Um, there's some, yeah, you can use, uh, you can use anything that's really searching for text. Uh, though those regular expressions really help with those because sometimes you don't necessarily know what you're looking for, you know, uh, you sometimes you don't know the exact term you're looking for or if you're looking for some sort of i or if you're searching the web for some kind of id number or emails you might want to if you want to find something that matches an e, a gmail address we might have to do we'll do that and i'll give an example of that in a bit now there are some shortcuts that are built in some of these care what are called character classes um they're built in because they're so useful. And I'm of course talking about fighter, thief, and mage. Wait, no, wrong, wrong character classes, my bad. Sorry, character classes are um, like this. Any slash W for any word character. Um, so this means anything that is a word character, anything that can go into a variable. So any letter, any number, and the underscores. That's what a W is. Similarly, slash D is short for any digit. We learned that last time, but it's been a week, so I, I'm going to review it. And then finally, this one's also very useful for when you're trying to for when, when you're trying to split text. Slash S, which looks for any white space. Okay, so. What kind of what and remember white space could be, you know, a space, tab, or um or okay, could be space, tab, or a new line. Okay. So what about so there's a couple of cool things we can do there as well. So notice that this was that slash D was anything that's number slash W slash S for white space. So what about negating those? That's also built in. If I do a slash capital W, it gives me anything that's not a, num a number, a letter, or an underscore. So it gives me the spaces and the punctuations, essentially. Similarly, slash capital D gives me anything that's not a digit. 
n slash s gives me anything, capital S gives me anything that's not white space. These aren't the most useful regular expressions, but they're there and that's great. All right. So that's so basically just being able to kind of, so those are just shortcuts built in. But the other thing that makes the, uh, but there's three things that make regular expressions really powerful besides these uh, things. And these are, and those are um, these symbols. Um, the star, the plus, and the, well, there's actually a number of these, so, but let's go with the star, the plus, and the quantifier. We've already learned about the quantifier. So for instance, if I wanted to do, <laughs> right? Let's say I wanted to uh, basically search for a bunch of laughs, okay? Suppose I wanted to see how many times I got basically a response that was like, ha ha, or LOL, right? In the chat or something. Okay. So how could I build a regular expression to match all these things? Well, first off to match LOL, that's pretty easy. But if I'm trying to match ha ha or LOL, I actually do have a tool there. So let's see what I've got here. So this matches a ha in H or an A, sorry, an H followed by an A, and then we've got a bar here. And that bar means or. Most programming languages use the vertical bar, but that's by the way, on your, that's right above your enter key on a US keyboard, shift and then the uh, slash, and then the backslash. That's your vertical bar. Programmers are pretty much the only ones who use that. <laughs> um, programmers and mathematicians. Um, but in most programming languages, this means or. So ha or LOL. And so it looks for any HA, like in share, or if it matches LOL. So it looks for any through the text and finds anything that matches the HA or the LOL. But this matches two ha's. What if I wanted to match multiple ha's? Like ha, 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 right? Well, if I wanted to match like three ha, ha's in a row, this doesn't work. This isn't necessarily working because this over here, the three quantifier is talking about the preceding thing, right? A preceding A. So that matches ha. Like I'm doing martial arts or something. Okay, that matches this H followed by three A's. But what if I want to match three A's in a row? Again, back to the way math does things, which is parentheses. And now you can see we match we match three ha's in a row. Okay. So now here's the other thing, cool thing we can do with these, uh, with this quantifier. We can give it a range. Ha ha, ha ha ha, and ha 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 ha. Okay, so it's two ha's, three ha's, five ha's. They cut them all. What does this quantifier mean? It means matching at least one, and at most five. If I added a sixth one, let's see. You'll note that it's a completely different match. It started a completely different match because it doesn't, because that's, it's done matching five ha's. And so it goes through the text and found, finds another ha by itself. So this is pretty cool. Most of, and so, um, because it allows you to basically just specify a range. So if I wanted to look for, any any number that was like uh, the any number that was less than ten thousand, I could do slash d for a number, and then one to four. 
right? And that will, and that highlights this three digit string over here and this two digit string over here. And as you can see, I've got this, 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 and this, right? It matches a bunch of four digits. Um, so what about those other two symbols I was talking about? So those come from, uh, so those are pretty interesting. Uh, the star here, the asterisk is called the clean star. Um, and this is one that's maybe a bit better explained with abstraction. So this matches the string A, B, A, A, B, B, A, A, B, 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 A, A, C, B, A, A, B, C, A, 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 B, B, A. All right, so uh, A followed by a B followed by an A. So I'm going to put in the clean star and you're going to see, and actually let me put in one more case up above everything. So I'm going to put in the clean star and you'll be able to see what happens with the clean star. Uh, the clean star being spelled K-L-E-E-N-E, -E -E, named after clean. So this is a very abstract operation, one that you normally don't think of. It is at least zero of the preceding. So A, B, A matches, A, B, B, A matches, A, B, 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 A matches, and A, A matches because each of them is an A followed by at least zero at least zero Bs followed by an A. In other words, it's kind of like an optional thing, except the optional bit, you can have as many of them as you want. Um, in the flow chart kind of idea here, going back to the idea of the flow chart and the turnstile, what we care about here in this finite state machine, this clean star is useful because it expresses situations like this, where you're trying to push on the locked turnstile and constantly pushing on it doesn't transition you to a different state, right? It doesn't move you to a different state. Make sense? That, that's what this is useful for because you have the, you don't, you know, if it's locked, you don't have to push on it, but somebody might try pushing on it and they might just try pushing on it forever. So that's what this clean star kind of helps represent situations on, of kind of a situation which might come up and you don't want to move from the state that you're in. Um, there is a very similar, so the plus operator is very similar to that, assuming I can actually hit the plus key, which apparently I can't. And that's at least one of, and that's much more easy to understand. At least one of, the follow sorry, of the preceding. So this has an A followed by at least one B followed by another A. So notice that it's the same matches except for the first one because there is no, because since there's not a B in the first one, it's excluded now. All right. And finally, in that same family is the question mark, which is a short, which is short for the following range, zero or one. It's a very common one for zero to one. In other words, question mark means the preceding thing is optional. It either has it or it doesn't, right? So it matches AA or ABA. This is useful for things like, again, British, like looking for a word that maybe has a British spelling. Like instead of looking for color, you might look for color, right? A British spelling, which tip, and many British spellings have an additional letter, right? So this will match color and uh, color, but not 
right? It's not going to match a uh, misspelling like color. Okay. Now, all the things I just went over can be done with the range, by the way, can be done with the quantifiers. Uh, so A, B, A, let's go ahead and set it up. So at least one of can be written like this, one comma blank and leave it blank. And that means at least one of, right? That's equivalent to our plus sign, right? This means at least two of, and so on and so forth, and at least zero of. You can do the other way around and, and, and put in a, wait, apparently you can't put in a, and we can say zero up to a maximum. So you, you leave off the other, it basically says up to however many you want. So it's pretty nice. Um, so let's kind of look at just a basic situation where I, where we could do, do some quantifiers, like if we're looking for multiple vowels in a row, A, E, I, O, U plus. So this is basically matches anything that's an A, E, I, O, or U followed by at least one of, and I have no idea why it's hitting the T over there. There we go. And that hits all basically sequences of vowels. So let's go ahead and talk about like one of the questions that uh, that I've or okay that was weird. Um, environment uh, lights four, three, one. You should control, no, nah, that, that screen says, hey, if you're in dual screen mode, you, you, you can't control mode. Got scared, I guess. All right. It, it, it knows that I do things via percussive maintenance. So, all right. So let's look at a question that I, I might, that I've asked like on a previous final exam. Okay, so let's go ahead and I'm going to just projector mute for a second. Actually, it doesn't matter because I'm gonna redo my questions anyway. So, um, so Canvas, let's go to a previous question and actually put these, what we've learned into practice. Because now we need to learn how to use it within regards to Python. Or actually, before I pull up, pull up a final exam, uh, sorry, an electronic final exam, let's pull up a previous paper final exam. GitHub, teaching, ITP. Let's do an old exam three practice and see what, what's in here. Because these are some pretty good problems, I think. Let's see. see. So write a with write a function, give a file name, creates a new file with the exact same contents as the original file, but with all the phone numbers such as one, two, three, open, so open parentheses, one, two, three, close parentheses, four, five, six, dash, seven, eight, nine, zero, replaced with the string private. Now you can do this without regular expressions, okay? Um, but regular expressions does make this a lot shorter. And we're gonna kind of, so write a function, given a file name creates a new file. So I'll go ahead and do that. So let's go ahead and save it. Um, phone num num private. Okay. Phone number private. Okay. 
So one of the things we can do with uh, with regular expressions here to make to keep your phone numbers private is let's see def um, redact phone and we're going to give it and we're going to take in a file name and I'll go also go and do the step of taking in uh, file name in file name out basically the file which we want to put things into and the file the file which we're reading and the file that we're going to write to because we want to write to a different file we don't want to overwrite our original file all right so reading a file again is pretty straightforward we just do the open and then we give it the file name that we want to read file name in and then set it up in read mode so that we can read it so So let's see, and I'll call this data. And then we can read it with one, and we can read it as just one giant string in one, in one command, which would be text is equal to data dot read. Remember read just simply takes the entire contents of the file, reads it all, stores it as a string. All the new lines and all are, are there stored as a string. All right. Now suppose that we have some output that we want to write to, that basically we, um, let's suppose we do stuff, the, do the redacting, okay? And we store that in output. Right, and notice basically that I've kind of split this up into multiple parts. Got the reading and the writing and the redacting as different parts. So here, what I'm gonna do for the app, for to write the file, what I need to do is I open up another file and say, open uh, file, writer is equal to, you can name it, I'm gonna name it file writer because we use the write command on it to write to a file. So open file name out, and then we open in and we have to use the W mode to write. Right, R for read, W for write. Very easy if you remember how to spell read and write. Okay, and then all I have to do is say output is equal to, sorry, not output, but file writer dot write the output to the file. Sometimes the, in, with large files, Python might want you to break it up into multiple steps. But if we look at write, give me a second, write, output and then we just say file writer dot close and so that will read the file and write the file so then we can call this now to make sure that the file reading and writing go fine and we're going to need some kind of test file so Notepad, open up notepad. Hello, my number is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. And my office num number is seven, 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 five, 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 seven, seven, seven. Do it in the same formats. Five, five, five. Right. I should have a hyphen between there. And I like this one because this one has increasing depth to it. Five, 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 five. And four. Like that. Okay. And now I will save this in my GitHub in the same folder. 
which is on GitHub. So documents, uh, GitHub, classroom, and then ITP 2022, and it's in, um, phone.txt. So I see this phone.txt. So I will now pass, and now I will do file. I'll call redact. So what I'm going to do over here first off is I'll print the text. This is not something that's going to stay in, but it's more just the point to kind of show that we've read the file. I'll read in phone.txt and out.txt is going to be our output file. Run this, run it, and redact text is not defined. Right, I called it redact phone, not redact text. All right. So the input and output finds redact, redact. redact. Uh, apparently spelling is hard. hard. All right, so um, text. Oh, print text, geez. I'm all over the place today. Test. Ah, no, text, just not in a string. Hello. Okay, so there's the file that we read. And then output.test, write it to the out file and close. And what we see over here in, um, one second, in out.txt, we will have a file that says test in it because we've just simply wrote out test. So you can see that the input and output, those are very easy to do independently of each other, right? So the bulk of this is actually that whole thing of redacting phone numbers. So we need to think about what a phone number is, or at least a US phone number, okay? Yeah, you could do that in one line, yes. You could totally do this in one line and just simply, instead of having data, you could do this, right? But I like to split it up because readability. So what does a phone number consist of? At least in the format that I gave. Well, first let's make it a bit easier for ourselves, right? A phone number is generally something like this, right? Three numbers, a hyphen, three numbers, a hyphen, and then four numbers, right? So that regular expression, phone, regex is will look something like this. And we don't have to import the regex library yet because we can write a regex anyway. Now, remember when I'm dealing with regular expressions, I'll probably be throwing around these slashes left and right. So I like to put the R for raw string, which means uh, don't, I'm not trying to like do any funky escape characters like slash T for tab or slash M for new line. So, just remember R for regular expression over here in front of the string. So we're looking for three digits, followed by a dash, followed by three digits, followed by a dash, followed by four digits, right? Okay. And so if we look for that, well, so now, we want to use that, we'll need to use the RE library. Now there's always a regular expression library in pretty much every uh, programming language. So what we can do, and there's a bunch of different ways we can do it. I'm going to use RE dot, um, let's see what kind of, there's RE dot match. Let's see what RE dot match does. Applies to the start of the string, so search. Returning a match object or none if when it's found. So I could look. So look for this pattern: phone regex.
in this string, which is text. And if I run this, I'm gonna get none. Oh, because I didn't save the file. Let me save it now. And it gives me back what's called a match object, which is what's used internally in Python to find regular expressions. And that's what it returned over here, a match object. So if I did print re.search, that will give me a match object for the first thing it finds, which is, says it spans, you found, I found this text, it's from here to here, <laughs> index 68 to 88. Okay. Yes. Why did it not find the, the one, two, three number? Um, it didn't find it because we're looking for three numbers followed by a dash, three numbers followed by a dash, and four numbers. And this is an open parenthesis, three numbers, a closed parenthesis, a space, three numbers, and a dash. So we're going to have to account for that. Okay. Because as you can see here, there's multiple ways to write a US phone number. Okay. So why don't we tackle that now? There are multiple ways to write a US phone number. Um, one way we can deal with this is by using that bar, right? To say, or to say, hey, there's different formats that we can do. All right. So there's multiple ways to write a regular expression a lot of times. So the other format that we can use for phone numbers is it starts with a parentheses. And if we want to look for a little parentheses, we have to go slash open parentheses. And then three digits. And why don't we go ahead and shorten these up, right? Three digits, three digits, open curly brace, close curly brace, four digits. Don't need that slash there. So three digits, dash, three digits, and four digits. And over here, we'll do the similar. So a parentheses followed by three digits, followed by a closed parentheses, okay? Followed by a space, followed by three digits, a dash, four digits and four digits. So we run this again. What the match operation does, when, or rather what the search re.search operation does is that it finds the first thing it can match. And it matches this over here, the very first number. So that's why it returns this, which is index 19 to 33. If you want to find all, your, all the matches in, in the text, there is a method built in called find all, which I find very useful, which gives you a list of all the things that it matched, which is all those phone numbers, right? And then finally, um, the one that we really use for kind of doing these replace operations though, is the re dot uh, the re dot sub which is short for substitute we want to look for anything that matches a phone regex and we want to replace it with um some kind of text. Here I'm going to go with, I said it was private. And then what am I searching in? I am searching in text. So now if I run this, it looks at all these. And now if I check my output, hello, my number is private. My office number is private or private. It's a pretty cool. It's pretty cool how short, how short the regular expressions can make these kind of operations. Now, uh, one example I really liked in the text, and part of the reason I like the textbook is that he's got fairly good examples and examples about RoboCop. 
I suppose I implied that's manually in exclusive, that's mutually exclusive. But uh, for instance, uh, sub the um, re dot sub, right here he does, hey, let's go ahead and do, so here he's creating a regular expression object, which means you don't need to take a regular expression in as a parameter. He creates the object and then he does, and so he just simply says, hey, create this regular expression, which is agent followed by a space, followed by any number of letters, right? So this would match agent, agent Carter, agent Alice, right? No, we're not turning this in. And what's cool is that sometimes you may need to use the match text itself as part of the substitution. So here is part of the cool part you can use a parentheses. And this is just kind of an idea of what we could do in the future with regular, what you could try to do with regular expressions, right? Which is that you can capture this and say, hey, what I'd like to substitute is what I first captured and a bunch of stars. So Agent Alice told Agent Carol, Agent Eve knew that Agent Bob was a double agent. This goes through and basically says a letter followed by any number of all letters. And I wanna pay particular attention to that first letter. That's why it's in parentheses. So slash one for the first per thing that we got in the first parentheses. And now it becomes, Agent Alice becomes A, Agent Carol becomes C, Agent Eve becomes E. So it basically censored everything but the first letter. We can do this, the similar thing in our operations here. For instance, I can keep in the area code by doing this capture. So by putting in a this gets a bit messy, but by putting parentheses around here, I could put slash one and then see if that works. And now, oh, now let's check the output. Did not like the one. Maybe did I need the R? Might have need the R here. Yep. My name, my number is one, two, three. My office number is. Aha, okay, I know why. I need to put this one outside so that it captures the area code fully like that. And now if I turn turn it, check, open it, now it captures the parentheses. And now we can see we're printing out. What's there? So this is like really powerful stuff. Um, but that is to say there is some kind of levels of madness that you can get with complicated and, re and regular expressions can become extremely powerful and extremely uh, large as if you want to read further into it. I'll leave you off though with like some, and I'll show you some kind of, there is kind of a level of madness for regular expressions though, and that is the regex for email. Um, and this is because valid emails are actually very hard um, to make one that is fully compliant uh, to the email uh, standard. Um, there's lots of, so let me see, email validation regex. There is, they're used, ah, oh, there it is, email regex. This is an email regex that 99.99% .99 works. And this tells if it's a valid email address. 
according to the RFC official standard. And this is this horror, and, and there it is in it, all of its horrifying glory. Because emails are actually fairly, um, are actually fairly, um, they're actually fairly powerful and fairly flexible. For instance, um, let's just take a look at my email, for example. My email address for Gmail is, is profandrewrosen at gmail.com. Okay, before, uh, I, I used to get everything forwarded to that before we switched <laughs> from Gmail and couldn't forward, uh, couldn't forward anything to Gmail anymore. But regardless, what's interesting about Gmail is that you, is that not only do you, is this your email, but so is this. Yeah, that's if you have a Gmail address, you can put plus and then any string you want in after it, and it will still get to you. Okay, now what, what's the use of this? Well, if you sign up for a website, you can put an identifier and see, uh, and when you get spam, you can see who sent you that original stuff. Or what I do a lot of times is that if I'm doing music, if I'm signing up for music stuff, I, I use Prof. Andrew Rosen plus music at gmail.com so that I could filter everything to my music if I wanted to, right? So you could do that, but that's, but how many of you knew at this point that plus signs were valid in email addresses? I didn't before I knew about this. Similarly, uh, if you need to separate it out, I can put in prof.andrew.rosen. By the way, that still gets to me because that also gets redirected to prof.andrewrosen at gmail. Because, any, because if you've got a Gmail address, any number of dots, go to the same place. Also a valid email address, by the way. Um, also nothing stopping this from being a, uh, from, from this being that, right? So email addresses are actually pretty complex to try to get, uh, to get them in general. Um, and But this one does its best to get all of them. And it's got a pretty big flow chart on how to do it. Um, so that's just pretty interesting, uh, I find. All right. So in a nutshell, those are regular expressions, OK? Um, now, let's, so again, I will be doing a question on a file that can be solved with a regular expression and is much easier when you solve it with a regular expression. And there's extra credit there if you wanna try to get practice on. Um, the other questions that I ask on the final are generally stuff that have to do with the Monte Carlo approximation. And so since that was asked today and we've still got plenty of time, why don't we take a look at that? And I'll probably figure out a more interesting topic for uh, Tuesday. Okay, because the reason, it, and the reason if this seems a little like unfocused and like, okay, yeah, I've, what else should I cover? Is because like, I have noticed since COVID has started, basically the rates of burnout from students trying to teach and, and trying to teach you more data at the end of the semester just doesn't really work so well. So hence, I tried to get everything done up to this point so that you'd have the big project to focus on and actually something interesting that you could self-teach. But I will figure that out. Um, let's see. What? So yeah, let's go ahead and pull that up. And then I will talk about maybe about PDFs on Tuesday. I know that sounds so interesting, but actually it really can be helpful to work with PDFs. Um, you wouldn't think it, but I'll show. But I'll show off some one thing that I'm very proud I made for myself. So, um, so let's go back to the uh, practice exam, teaching, ITP, 
practice exam three. Uh, no. Okay. Then what about practice final? Do I have a practice final? Yeah, practice final answers. All right. Nope, 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 nope. Final exam from a previous semester. Not really? Oh, was it in the exam three itself? I know I, sorry, I know I had one. Or was it an exam two? Ah, yes, exam two. All right. So this was a problem I gave for Monte Carlo in a different examination. So in the game board, board game Monopoly, like, you know, the, uh, the one that everybody thinks they know how to play, but actually they've never sat down and read the rules about it. And therefore the game goes on for hours upon hours upon hours, rather than ending swiftly and brutally, which was kind of the point of the game. All the home rules that you add, they don't give anybody a better chance of winning. They just prolong the suffering because the point of Monopoly is that someone gets a Monopoly and becomes the runaway winner very quickly. Okay, so anyway, the board game Monopoly, we, uh, and again, if I bring up games, you don't necessarily need to know how to play the game. I'll explain every, all the concepts to you right here. In the board game Monopoly, players move around the board by rolling a pair of six-sided die, D6s, right? You roll two D6. This gives you a range of what values, by the way? Two D6 gives you range from two to 12, yeah. Now this is of course not uniformly distributed, okay? Um, when you roll one die, and it's, it's fascinating, right? Rolling one die, that's something uniformly distributed. But as soon as you get two into the equation, that's normally distributed. Um, what do I mean by that? Right? This is this is uniformly distributed. All the outcomes have an have an equal probability of occurring, right? All the outcomes have a one-sixth chance of occurring. Right? But the minute I include two, that becomes a normal probability with the most common outcome being somewhere like between six and seven, right? Right, in other words, getting, uh, a, and getting it with a two being the least common outcome and a 12, sorry, two and 12 being equally uncommon. Why? Because you, in order to get a, in order to get a 12, there's only one way to get a 12. I will be sharing the code. In order to get a 12, there's only one way to do that. You have to roll a six and a six, right? In order to get a one, you have to roll a one and a one. The only way you can do that, that's a one in 36 chance for either of those, right? One in 36 chance to get a two, one in 36 chance to get a 12. Meanwhile, to get, um, to get a, you know, a six, we could roll a five and a one, a two and a four, a three and a three, or a four and a two, or a five and a one, right? There's lots of different, there's relatively a lot of ways to do this. So it becomes a normal distribution. Anyway, so the point I'm trying to make here is that one common mistake when I see somebody, when we roll two six-sided dice, is that somebody rolls a dice and then doubles that value which is not what we're looking for. Anyway, but, and also the reason I bring up this up is that in Monopoly, there's a special rule for doubles, which is that if I roll 2d6 and they come up with the same value, okay? And what do I mean by that? Suddenly this goes out, it is irrelevant if I'm talking about doubles. What I'm talking about is if I roll two ones or two twos or two threes or two fours, right? 
if they if both dies land on the same face, this is good because you essentially get an extra turn. You get a roll again in Monopoly. Uh, and you can do this quite a bit. You, if you roll a second pair of doubles, you get a second extra turn essentially. But if you roll doubles, but if you roll your third time and you get doubles, you go immediately to jail for speeding because that's Monopoly and it has weird rules like that. Um, and ironically, that traps you until you can roll a double. So here's what the program is interested in. Write a program that will simulate 100,000 Monopoly turns. Now, extra rolls due to doubles will count as part of the same turn, okay? Right, it becomes your turn when you start your turn and it stops when it becomes some other player's turn. Make sense? Even though I use the turn, it's essentially getting an extra turn. It's not the same because you aren't going twice. It's all this part of the same turn. Okay. So your program should print out what turn, where turn. So what we want to compute is the number of rolls that have no doubles, the percentage of rolls with one double, the percentage of rolls with two doubles, and the percentage of rolls with three doubles. In other words, uh, percentage of rolls where I just roll normal. Percentage of roll times I get an extra turn. Where I kind of get two extra turns and then where I roll three times and go directly to jail. Um, now notice, and now here is, the, is a rubric. And this is what I find very important on the final exam to include when I say it's only X questions because um, pedagogical for a second for those who are interested, right? Students panic when they've got a large value question and they have no idea where to start or how it's going to be graded. Uh, the rubric, providing a rubric gives you both of those things. It tells you where to start and what I care about and how much it's going to be worth. So 10, po uh, 10 points for simulating 10,000 dice rolls, five points for handling double, this is out of 20. Three points for handling two and three doubles in a row, and two points for actually giving me the full answer, right? So building up for it. So similarly on the exam, it will be stuff like this, like on the right on the regular expression string string detecting. That is basically five points. It's going to be like five points for reading the file, five points for writing the file. If you remember how to read and write a file, that's free ten free points. You know. So okay. Let's go with um, make a new file, save it. I'm going to call it Monopoly. So let's go ahead and we are going to write two functions that I'm, go that I'm going to need, which are, um, so first off, we're going to need to import random. All right, for doing Monte Carlo, we're doing things at random. Okay, the first thing I'm going to do is I want to simulate the dice somehow. Okay, now this is a fairly standard day, a, a game, so we can, so there's basically two really easy ways to do that. So def roll d6. Okay. Okay, it's not going to take any arguments, and there's two ways we can do this. The first way we can do that is uh, return, and this is the way you probably will instinctively reach to, which is good. Random.rand int one through six. That gives me a random integer, one, two, up to, and including six. Randomness is like the only thing where it includes the endpoint. Okay. And that's going to give me a number from one to six. I don't want to now, but my well, Professor Rosen, we're doing two dice. Why am I just writing a function that does one dice? Because we care about the val the, val the values of two different dice, so we have to so we're going to call this function twice, and see if the results match. If uh, the only the only other thing we could do is roll the dice and tell us in the function and return whether or not those two dice rolls match. So, all right, roll d six. The other way we can do this, and this is useful if your dice is not standard, like if your dice doesn't have the normal values on it or you're playing a children's game that has dice with colors on it, right? Then what you want is, then we could do basically uh, choice it, sorry, 
we could do sides is equal to one, two, three, four, five, six, right? Have whatever sides there are, right? And do random dot choice of your sides. Does that make sense? And random that choice, if you remember, that selects something randomly from a sequence. So if you give it a string, it will select one of the letters at random. It's essentially going to generate a random. It's going to figure out what the ind valid indices are and generate a random ind index. So if I were, for instance, to put, um, so if you played Mario Party, right? Uh, let's see, I forget. But basically, there's a, some dice that are custom. Like, I think, uh, let's see, like Mario, ha, like, what is it? Yoshi, like, has two sevens and, like, a, and a zero, like, and a one and a one and something like that. But basically, the dice are, 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 are non standard. So that's kind of where you might find that useful. I might go to Mario Party for my uh, for my Monte Carlo question. That might be fun. All right. Next is um, we will simulate a turn. Okay. Or rather, we'll simulate yeah a turn. Okay. So what? So a turn. What do we need to do on a normal turn? Ignoring the doubles thing for right now because our rubric, uh, the rubric for uh, for our problem ignored doubles for right now. So I don't see why we shouldn't do the same thing. Yeah, our rubric ignored says, hey, just focus on simulating a hundred thousand of these things first. Okay, so yeah, too many things open. Jeez. Okay. So in that case, I'm going to say die one is equal to roll d6. Die two is equal to roll d6. All right. And then, um, and then what I'm going to do, okay. So before I move on, let's see, let's see if, and we're going to want to check if they're equal or not at some point. If die one equal equals die two, and for right now I'll just return true. And then otherwise I'll return false, right? And what this will, and the reason I'm doing this is that I'm just kind of making placeholders. But now to do this 10,000 times. So um, trials, trials is equal to 100, 000, let's do, we want to do 100,000 of these. So it would be four in range trials. And then we call turn. So this, according to my rubric, is 10 points, right? But at least it's a way to get started with it, right? We've got a dice, we roll the dice twice, we, we do this 10,000 times. Okay, so what am I actually looking for with this one? Well, with this one, what I'm looking for is how many turns have no doubles, how many have one double, a two double, or a three double? So really what I should return rather than true or false, a lot of the true stuff I, I, I uh, Monte Carlo's, they're like true or false, right? Are you won or you're lost? This one's different. It's not if you won or you lost, it's did you, what, what value did you get? So rather than returning true or false, um, we'll return, hey, if die one, is equal to die two, then we got we got a doubles roll. They matched. So in this case, I'll put down return one 
and it'll put down a return zero otherwise, right? For no doubles versus one doubles, right? But you can get up to two or three doubles in a row. Was that correct? No, okay, okay, wasn't sure. So, and now what I'll say is, hey, if, so I'll say result is equal to, result is equal to turn. Um, and hey, I can, I, I can set up two options. I can either do a dictionary, but I also know my outcome. So I could create just four variables, which are like uh, num, so no doubles, no dubs equals zero, one dub. Um, and then we'll have a two dubs and a three dubs for to represent my how many times I got a double, right? Those will be my outcomes. And again, this isn't necessarily this. Yes. Can you? I'm a little confused. Um, I feel like can't you only have like twelve two sides? Can't you only have doubles or no doubles? Yes, but then you'll have to roll them again. When you roll two doubles, in, so in Monopoly, when you roll a double, uh -huh. what happens is that you get to roll again and go further. So, but. If you do that a second time, if you roll two doubles, you get to roll it again and go even third further. But if that third roll is also a double, so if you roll, if you get them to show up on the same dice face three times in a row, you go immediately to jail. So there's no chance to, and your turn ends. So there's no chance to roll more than three. Make sense? Yeah. Right. It's kind of like one of those um, multipliers. So, so here right now, but basically the idea here is that the result is if we get a zero, if result is equal to zero, no dubs plus equals one. And so as you can see, this would be a standard kind of for loop where basically there's, or if state, if block, where there's just a bit of typing we have to do. Yes, there's there are smarter ways to do this, or not smarter, but how to say, um, conciser ways to do this. Right? Else if results equals one, one dubs plus equals one, right? And those ways involve either Create, storing our answers in a list or a dictionary, but I don't want to overcomplicate things at the moment because if it works, I want the points. Three dubs. Okay, one, two, three. So those are our results. So if they match, there's two outcomes that can happen from here. So first off, if they don't match, let's go ahead and actually like structure this a bit more logically or verbosely, because what I'm about to do is completely unnecessary, but it helps write things out, which is sometimes good for code. If die one and die two are not equal, return zero, right? They don't match, we can stop. Otherwise, if they match, then, I'm not necessarily gonna return one because I have to roll the dice again, right? And that's the kicker, I have to, that's the catch here. I have to roll the dice again. If I get a match, then I have to roll the dice again. If they, if they don't match, I'm done. I only got one double. If they do match, then I, get, then I have to keep going on. So in other words, what am I saying? Well, I'll re-roll. If die one are equal and die two are equal, I re-roll die one, I re-roll die two, and I'm gonna ask the same question over here. If they don't match, and I'm doing don't because the end result is that it looks cleaner if I do it this way. That's the only reason I'm doing if they don't match. If they don't match, 
then I've rolled one double total, right? So I'll return one. Assuming I can spell return, which is apparently a difficult task today. <laughs> so, right, we've got, so if they, if they, so if I roll, I get a two and a two, then I roll and I get a five and a six. They don't match, so I only got one double this turn. But else, if, but else, but L if they do match, which is the same as saying else, but otherwise if they do match, I have to roll them one more time. Dice. And if they don't match, we get a two, right? And we can stop here because if, if they, if we roll the dice again and they don't match, that's a two, but if they do match, then we did it three times in a row at speeding, so to go directly to jail. So there we go. Now there's another way, of course, we can do this, which is that um, which is that we could do a loop. We could do a while loop, you know. Um, which is, and we could do this like, and the while loop might look something like this. Wow. Um, num dubs is equal to zero. Number of doubles is equal to zero. While num dubs is less than uh, three. I'm putting parentheses. That's a that's a that's a Java thing to do. While the number of dubs to roll is equal is is less than three. Um, let's see. If die one is not equal to die two, then we can stop rolling. We'll just simply return num dubs and that's going to break and return stops the function if you remember so that would stop the function else num dubs plus equals one and that condenses the logic that i've done into just these lines which way is the better way to do it i don't know whatever gets you the right answer honestly this one's short enough that if, if it was an arbitrary number then you'd want to need to use a while loop. But we're saying there's only four possible outcomes. So it's perfectly fine to enumerate those outcomes logically like this. Okay. So now for the last thing, now I realize that I'm pretty much out of time here. So the last thing now to do is basically we just simply print we run, we run this, we print no dubs divided by trials one dubs, two dubs, three dubs, run it because I'm out of time. And we'll see that I'm getting zero and zero for the other one, which means that my logic must be off somewhere. Two dubs. Oh, result is equal, else if his result is equal to one. Result is equal to two, result is equal to three. There you go. Remember, your computer's an evil genie and copying pasting while talking can be very difficult sometimes. So there we go. So, there's a 13% chance of rolling a double, one, about one in six, and a 2% chance of rolling two doubles in a row, 
and about half a percent chance of rolling three doubles in a row and go and getting speed and getting uh, speeding. All right, so I will upload these onto my GitHub. Um, for those of you who need it sooner, though, I'm going to go ahead and just drop it into chat. Um, but I will post it on GitHub. So Monopoly. One second, everyone in meeting. Monopoly and uh, phone number five. There you go. And so now I will drop the. And now I'll just go ahead and upload these on GitHub. Mike, I see you have your hand raised. Yes. And class is dismissed. I'll see you all on Tuesday. Hey there, what's up? So, I have a quick question about the final project. So, my final project 